because you are here. Amen. So you just won half of the battle by being here. <laughs> That's just half of the battle. So thank you, Lori. Thank you, broadcast viewers, to our monthly Woman of Valor um, event, right? Um, so as you know, we change from twice a month to once a month. So hopefully more of you could come, bring your friends, invite someone each month. Try to invite someone and say, you know what? I've been blessed. I give God all the glory, and I want that for you. Just come one time, experience it, and you're going to see how God works in your life. Amen? So um, today's, um, this month's topic is going to be getting in the right track. Getting in the, in the right track. And how many of you feel like you need to get in the right track? Well, how many of you know if you are in the right track? <laughs> you know, you know I, don't know, I don't know if it's ever happened to you. When I leave a, a meeting, right, and I had an exhausting day, and I leave a meeting, and I want to come home, and I take I-95, and instead of coming south, I go north. <laughs> You know, because I take the wrong turnpike because I'm either on the phone, I'm not paying attention, I'm hungry, I'm tired, and I go zoom north. <laughs> and then I go, yeah, I got to go faster because I want to make it home. Oh, look, there's no traffic. Of course there's no traffic because the traffic was on the other side, on the side that I needed to go, which is south. <laughs> and then after many, many miles, that I get off the phone and I go, wait, I wasn't Exit 99, how could it, I possibly be in exit 150? <laughs> how does that happen? Oh, and that's when I realized I was going fast. I thought I was getting to the right place, but I was going the wrong direction. And how many of you feel like your life today feels like, you know, you're going at full speed, and all of a sudden you're like, am I in the right track? And today we're going to help you find out if you are in the right track. And if you're not, what are the steps that we need to do to get back in the right track spiritually? Right? We're talking about in the spirit. Getting back in track with God, right? Who is your creator. Hi, welcome. And um, so um, that's why I entitled this teaching, Getting in the Right Track. So I'm going to start off with a, a, a cute um, story. I'm not sure many of you have heard of it. There was a chicken and a pig walking down the street one day. Have you heard of it? No? Good. Okay. And they come across a grocery store, and the grocery store had a sign, desperately need in need for bacon and eggs. Bacon and eggs desperately needed. So the chicken looks to the pig and says, hey, why don't we help out? You know, I could donate some of my eggs, and you provide the bacon. And the pig said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> are you crazy? And the, and, the, and, and, the, and the chicken goes, why? What's the problem? Well, what's the problem? And, and the, pig, the pig goes, well, you're only making donation. I need to sacrifice and give it all. Amen? <laughs> That's what the problem is. And today, ladies, we are here, and I want you to evaluate yourself. Are you the type of Christian that is a chicken donating your time instead of sacrificing your time unto the Lord? A lot of us Christians make little donations here and there and say, oh, that's good enough for God. But God wants the bacon. God wants the lamb chop. God wants the whole pig. God wants to sacrifice. And that's what the difference is between being a chicken in the spirit or a pig in the spirit where you sacrifice. Being an unmature woman of God, a woman of God that's constantly struggling, a woman of God that you're constantly in fear and anxiety and, and sorrow and worry and, and grief, as opposed to a woman of God that may experience everything that you might be experiencing, but it does not affect her because of her God. Because why? Because we surrender to God. And that's my teaching today about surrendering to the great I am, the Holy One. So 
Um, what's the meaning of surrender? In Christianity, the first main principle of surrender is what? Dying to self. Sacrifice. Denying yourself. That's the meaning of surrender in Christianity. As a daughter of the king, sacrificing, denying yourself, dying to self. Just like the pig will have to die to give us a bacon, <laughs> we will have to sacrifice ourselves to get God's glory. Now, the dictionary, the, the Webster dictionary, surrender means yield to the power. Whose power? God's power. Lose control to God's control. Or procession of another upon compulsion or demand. Yes, God demands for us to surrender and die to self. To give up completely or agree to forego, especially in favor of another. You're giving yourself up to favor someone else. We're favoring God. To give oneself up into the power of another, especially as a prisoner. Nobody, li nobody likes the word to be a prisoner. But Paul says that we need to be a prisoner of Christ. <laughs> but when it comes to prisoner, what do we think? Oh, I'm, I'm going to lose all my freedom. I'm going to be limited to going out. I'm going to be limited to what I want to do. I'm going to lose so much. Well, that is true in the physical world. We don't want to end up in prison. But in the spiritual world, which is totally different than this, the, the physical world, you gain. We gain when we lose ourselves. We gain power when we surrender and relinquish unto the mighty one. Amen? So I want to ask my sister, um, Christine, Christy and, and um, Angela. Angela, go out and give out. Uh, I have little flags for everybody. All right. And um, Chris is going to give you a pen. It's a pen for cloth, so it's not going to bleed. Don't write anything on this flag, except in the very top, I want you to write surrender. The very, very top of the flag up here, or maybe on the side. You know, be creative. It's your, it's your surrender flag. <laughs> write surrender. And then don't do anything else. And then if you hear something that encourages you today in this teaching, that encourages you or agree, you agree or your spirit receives, your mind says, oh, oh, man, that hurts, but my spirit receives it, I want you to wave this flag unto the Lord. Amen? Can we do that? Yes. And those of you that are watching online, you could join us uh, live so you could take part of this next time. Amen? All right, so let's be real. Surrender could be a very scary thing, right? Surrender could be a very scary thing because it brings a sense of fear because you know everything that is in you that God has asked you to let go. And you feel if you surrender everything that God has asked you to let go, that you're going to lose control. And that's absolutely right. You need to lose your control in those situations to allow God give room, like the worship section said, to give room for him to move in your place. Amen? Amen. So all the things that you've, you analyze that are going in your life that you need to let go. So many things that we need to let go. And by you letting go, you're going to feel fear, frightened, unsure, insecure. But, and, and those feelings are, are normal because we're so used to like grow, holding on with a tight grip. And we're like, oh, what do I do with my hand if I don't have these things that I'm holding, what do I do with my time? What do I do with my emotions if I let these things go? But you give it out to heaven, and you have a free hand to now receive more of his presence, more of his power, 
Amen? So, let me ask you, does this sound like you? Although you know, and I said, if you feel something that speaks to your heart, surrender it to God. Although you know you can't change people, although you know you can't change things, although you know you can't change in your power certain circumstances, but you just can't stop trying. You just can't stop trying to make it happen. It's been many years. It hasn't been a month. It's been many years, many tears, many pain that you trying to come and change those things, and you still can't surrender it. You still can't let it go. That's me. Amen. And it gets to the point that you're exhausted. It gets to the point that you get discouraged. It gets to the point that you feel that you're swimming against the current. Have you ever swam against a current at the beach? I have. Where you keep swimming and the current keeps pushing you back and you keep wanting to go. And then I'm not a good swimmer. I don't know how to hold my, my, my breath underwater. So if I will go underwater, I can't breathe. <laughs> so I have to try to keep my head up. And you feel like you could barely breathe because you're going against the current. And you're exhausted. And the more you try to go forward, you see the land where you're going to be steadfast, strong in the land. The land keeps getting further because you keep going further against the, against the current. I mean, with the current. That's how we are emotionally when we don't surrender. That's how we are where we feel like I can't hardly breathe. My heart feels like a raggedy rag. My heart feels like a rag. My lungs feel like they're going to explode when we go against our spiritual and not surrender to the Lord. Amen? And then we live, by, live day by day just feeling worn out. How many of you feel worn out? Right? It feels like you're worn out. It feels like, is this ever going to change? Is this... Am I ever gonna? Am I ever gonna get a break? And when you're swimming against the current, you kind of touch the flower, thinking, "Oh, I wish I could find a little rock that I could kind of step on really quick, so I could get some air." That's how we, many of us ladies, are emotionally. Amen. Amen. So, my beloved sister, this morning, I'm here to tell you that Satan will never whisper to your ears, "Do not surrender to God." Satan will never whisper that in your ears. Hey, don't surrender to God. Instead, Satan plays a very spiritual, masterful, diabolical game of chess with you. Where he plots and he schemes, putting you, putting us in a position to surrender to something else or someone else that is not God. That's what Satan does. He doesn't tell you, hey, don't surrender to God. But he puts you in a position where you're surrendering to someone else and something else that's not God. And when you're not surrendered to God, guess what? You are out of the presence of God. <laughs> so... You gotta, you gotta get to know the enemy, and the enemy has been doing this since the beginning from Adam and Eve. The enemy, the serpent, the serpent. Remember, before the serpent, the serpent came. Adam and Eve, they had a relationship with God. All their life was for God. God put it in command until the serpent came and said, "But are you sure that you cannot eat from that?" He put doubt. He put unbelief on Eve. He didn't say, hey, stop surrendering to God. He didn't say that. He just said, are you sure? Are you sure? Come on, eat it. <laughs> right? He puts unbelief. And, he, and with that unbelief and with that not trusting God, it puts us in a position 
where we automatically stop surrendering to God and start surrendering to other things. And it totally gets us out of his presence and out of his peace. So in the book of Samuel, I'm sure you girls listen, uh, heard of this story before. In the book of Samuel, there's a story about a lady named Hannah. Amen. And let me tell you, the more I read and I studied her story of Hannah, God kept revealing, which I'm going to share with you. And you know when you meditate in the word, you're opening up yourself to receive from God. Meditate on the word is so powerful because you could read something, but God will reveal something that is not even written in the Bible. And you're like, wow, God, thank you for speaking to me. So the, the story of Hannah is a story of a woman of sorrow and faith. Hannah was married to Elkanah, and he was also married to another womb woman named Penina. So Alcana had a, Hannah and Penina as a wife. Poor guy. <laughs> Anyways. And then Penina had children, but Hannah did not. And back then in the culture in those times, not having children, you were seen as an outcast, and you were seen as you were cursed by God. Isn't that amazing? And to nowadays, people are aborting their children. Isn't that what a, what a change? So Hannah's husband, Hannah's husband, uh, Elkanah, loved Hannah. And he tried to encourage her. And the, and the Bible says that he would say, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you cry? Why do you not eat? Are you guys at a point where you're always crying about a situation, weeping about a situation to a point that you don't even want to cry, to a, uh, that, uh, that, that you don't even want to eat, that you cry and you don't want to eat, to a point where you don't want to leave your house, to a point? How many of us feel that? Wave your flag. Amen? There you go. Surrender it to the Lord. It says, why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? And then he says, I am not, I am, am I not better to you than 10 sons? He's like, don't you love me enough? <laughs> Pobre hombre. <laughs> Poor man. And that was in verse 8. Now, every year Hannah would accompany her husband in worshiping and sacrificing to God in Shiloh. Every year they go to Shiloh. They make their annual sacrifice. Back then they used to sacrifice animals, okay? And every year, imagine having... Sharing your wife, um, sharing your husband with a wicked wife, una pesada. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, bad enough that poor Hannah uh, was grieving because she wanted to have a, a son so bad or a child so bad. But then she had to share her husband with a pain, with an arrogant woman. Because every year, Penina would provoke Hannah to the point of tears by reminding her that she was childless. Imagine living with someone like that. Maybe you do live with someone like that. Someone that constantly reminds you of what you don't have. Someone that constantly reminds you what you cannot provide. But look what Hannah did. So now, I'm going to show you how Hannah went from a woman of sorrow to a woman of faith. So, um, so Penini, Penina was making her life miserable. <laughs> wow. So one year I saw at Shiloh, Hannah just gave up. What's to give up? Surrendered. Surrendered. Hannah prayed to the Lord while she was in great anguish. She cried out to God. She vowed in her prayer that if God will give her a son, she will give, her, she will give the child to be God's servant. Now, one thing that I found out about this story is that Hannah wasn't barren. She was not born without being able to have kids. God was withholding her child. 
What promises are God withholding from you because you're not ready to receive it? Amen. So now, it got to the point that Hannah cried out to God and she came to her senses and said, God, if you give me this child, I will surrender him to you. What kind of woman that wanted a child so desperately would say, give me the child, but I'm going to give him back to you. It's yours, Lord. That's a surrender woman. And see, when I was taking a shower, God revealed to me, because I was meditating on that, and he revealed to me so clearly that Hannah, firstborn, was Samuel, prophet Samuel. And God had a purpose for Samuel. So God need to make sure that Hannah would dedicate him to God because God had a purpose for him. He did not want to give her a child where she could elaborate and say, oh, look, look, I could have a child now. Look at me. I am not barren. God gave me favor. It wasn't for her to brag. It's this, that her desire was going to be dedicated to God because God has already, had already a purpose for Samuel. And the purpose that, Sam, that God had for Samuel, Samuel needed to be brought up just the way this, that Hannah did because she kept her promise. She took Samuel, she, uh, Hannah took Samuel every year to Shiloh for the sacrifices. She raised them up in the ways of the Lord. She instructed him and she kept her promise. And because God saw her heart, he said, now I'm going to give you that son that, you've been, that has been causing you so much grief. Because you're not asking it for yourself. Now you're asking that son for me, for my purpose. And I, when God revealed that to me, I'm like, God, there's so many things that I want in my life, but I want it selfishly. Now I know that I'm going to ask for the same things unselfishly. Because I'm going to dedicate it and devote it to you. And you see how you're going to receive this miracle. Because God gave her her son. And since um, the high priest at that time that she would go to Shiloh was Eli. And Eli saw her dedicated to how she dedicated her son every year. And, and she brought her son to in the ways of the Lord. And then, wait, before I go there... Let's read Samuel, 1 Samuel 1, 11. And she made this vow. O Lord of heaven's armies. That is reverence. How many of us open up our prayer in reverence? Or do we open up our prayer in, God, I need this, I need that. Instead of giving him honor first. O Lord of heaven's armies. If you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sacrifice. I will surrender him to you. He will be yours for the entire lifetime. And the sign that he has been dedicated to you, O oh Lord, is that his hair will never be cut. So it came to a point that she finally figured it out. Her sorrow, finally, she figured it out and said, you know what? If you give me the son, God, I promise. And he saw her heart that she was going to be faithful with that promise. How many of us have made promises to God that we don't keep? <laughs> and then you wonder, oh God, why God doesn't give us our blessings? Because he knows as soon as he gives you the husband, you're going to stop coming to church. Or as soon as he gives you the house, you're going to be going to the beach and not coming to church. Or as soon as what up, because your intentions of the heart is not to give him glory with the blessings that he gives you, but for your own benefit. Yeah, God wants you to benefit from his, bene from his, uh, uh, from his uh, blessings, but you got to put him first. You have to give him glory with that that he gives you. Amen? Yes, amen. Glory to God. So... 
let's know first that she had addressed God very respectfully and with faith in his power, with an attitude of humility, and she is willing to relinquish to God, to give to God the very thing she has been so desperately praying for. Then Hannah did, not, did another worthy thing. She went her way and she ate. That's a sign that she started trusting God. When you could eat peacefully with a husband that is scornful, when you could eat peacefully with people that talk bad about you, when you could eat peacefully with people that make your life miserable, then you know that you have surrendered to the great I am and that you're trusting God over above your situation. Amen? And then, uh, and then Eli saw how she d- devoted Samuel to God. And Eli prayed this upon her. The Lord gives you descendants from this woman. The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan of the given Lord. For the loan, uh, for the loan that was given to the Lord. Right? So after Eli prayed this upon her, God gave her three sons and two more daughters. <laughs> Amen? And then her sorrow went, and in 1 Samuel 2, 1 says, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. She rejoiced because God saw and made that, that, that change in her, gave her. But he had to see that she was, uh, um, that she was worthy of that blessing from him. So, ladies, the secret, this secret to surrender, Hannah got to the point when she was no longer worried about what she thought that she needed, but became a person who was satisfied in the God that she already had. When you become satisfied in the God that you already have, you learn to trust him, and he will move in your behalf. So you will give anything when you believe that God is your everything. How many of us believe that God is our everything? Don't raise this hand if you don't believe that God is your everything. Because when God is your everything, you give your anything to him. I know surrender can be scary. It takes tremendous effort. Many of us us don't know how to surrender. But I know that all of us know what we need to surrender. So I want you to get your little white flag. There's some new, if you don't mind giving some of the, I want you in a pen. Get your pen and your white flag. And right be, below surrender, I want you to write everything that you know you need to surrender. And everything that God has asked you to surrender. Okay? It could be. Your spouse, it could be your children, it could be your finances. What are the costs, what are the things? It could be your singleness. It could be that you're married to a stubborn mule. It could be anything that causes grief in your heart. It could be your attitude. It could be your unbelief. It could be your mouth saying bad words. It could be your anger. It could be your jealousy. It could be your lack of trust. It could be your unbelief. It could be anything that causes your grief and does not allow you to surrender. I want you to write them down in the white flag. Once you come to these terms, once you come to the terms that surrender will cost you something, It's a sacrifice. Surrender doesn't mean that I'm doing it because I like it. Surrender means that I'm doing it as a sacrifice. It will cost you something. You'll understand that that satisfaction with God 
is not gained until a sacrifice is provided. Satisfaction with God is not obtained until a sacrifice is provided. What do you need to sacrifice unto the Lord? And now really quick, because I only have like five more minutes. <laughs> there are four steps of surrender, and I'm going to go with them really quick. First, admit you have a problem. Can we all say, let's be like AA Anonymous, right? Surrender Anonymous. Can we all say, when I say one, two, three, we're going to say, hi, my name is Sandra, and I have a problem. And you're going to say your name. Don't say my name, okay? <laughs> I'm not that bad. So say, hi, and your name, I have a problem. One, two, three. Hi, I'm Sandra, and I have a problem. <laughs> let's just start with one. All right? That's the first step. you got to admit you have a problem. Because in Romans 3.23 it says, For everyone has sinned, everyone means all of us, and we all fall short of God's glory. This means that we have gone against the will of God. We have gone against the command of God. We have ignored his teaching. And we have chosen our will over his will. Houston, we have a problem. Number two, open up your whole heart to God. In a relationship, how many of us want to be in a relationship where you're all in, you're all in love, but the other person holds back? Huh? huh. That's painful. That's not, that's not, that's not what we want. But that's how God feels. God says, I gave you a living sacrifice. I gave you my son. And still, you are not giving me your whole heart. You're making little egg contributions. Like the chicken makes a contribution without killing herself because the pig needs to die to give you bacon. And he says, I have given you my son to bring you not only peace in earth, but bring you an eternal life. Because remember, we're here only temporary, and still, you're only making contributions. You're not giving your whole heart to God. Wow. So we all know when we're in a relationship that we're not all wholeheartedly in, that relationship is bound to fail, or you're going to be miserable. And that's why some of us, even though we have God, we still experience moments of misery because we're not wholeheartedly in, wholeheartedly in. And Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with what? Say it. All your heart. Not partial, all. This is an internal, timeless promise to all those who seek the Lord in spirit and in truth, you sure will find him. And when you find him, you will find favor. And when you find him, you will find your destiny. And when you find him, you will find your purpose. And when you find him, you will find eternal peace. Amen? The third one, be willing to change. Are you willing to change? Be willing and pleading consistently until you see that change. <laughs> it's not like, okay, Sandra, today I'm going to surrender this, but tomorrow I'm going to pick it back up. Oh, I'm going to surrender this, but in a month I'm going to pick it back up. It's surrender and bury it. Amen? So you have to plead consistently until you see that change. Until you see that breakthrough. If you don't see that change in your heart, in your, in your behavior, in your thought process, the word says renew your minds. It needs to be consistently speaking with God, reading his word, not only on Sundays and Thursdays and once a month with the ladies. There are things in our life that we just don't want to let them go. But we know we need to let it go. We must humble ourselves and say, dear God, I love, I love this. Or I love these things. Or these things are hard for me to let go because I've been doing it for so long. I just don't know how. But nevertheless, I want and need to let them go because you want me to let it go. 
because you're asking me to let it go. And then it has to be a point that you have to say, oh, Lord, give me the ability to give it up. Because you know that you cannot do it in your own strength. Give me the ability. Give me the desire to give it up. Give me the desire and the ability to give it up. you got to pray this for yourself. Stop looking at what everybody else needs to do to improve your quality of life. Your quality of your life is in your hands. Stop blaming everybody else and everything else and your environment. The quality of your life is in your hands when you surrender unto the heavens. But you have to pray every day until you see that change, until you see that envy goes, until jealousy goes, until you get your husband, until your marriage improves. Every day, God, give me the desire and the ability because I cannot do it on my own. Philippians 2.13, I like the Amplified Version. For it is not your strength, but it is God who effectively I work in you both. He is working in you both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose. For his good pleasure. You will bring pleasure to the Lord when you're walking in your purpose. And now some of you that are dealing with strongholds, things that have control over your life, a bad habit, just something in your life that you need to let go. You are going to plead every day, plead, Lord, until you see the breakthrough. In 1 Chronicles 16, 11, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually, longing for his presence. <laughs> that is the secret, my, sis my sisters. And number four, in the last time, the last one, when you fail, which we will, when you fall, which we will, get back in track. Don't stay down there. Get back in track. It says, Proverbs 24, 15. The godly man, are you a godly woman? Amen. Are you or not a godly woman? The godly woman trip seven times, but they will get up back again. You may trip, but you're going to get back up again. That's what's going to make a difference between you being a godly woman or a woman still in the flesh. When you get up back up again, God, I fail, but you're going to give me the strength. You're going to recover me. You're going to lift me up high. You are depending on his strength, not on your own understanding. Last, surrender. When you surrender everything that you wrote here, and if you go home and you could think of more things, this is your flag. And if you don't want anybody to see it, just fold it and put a, uh, a tie around it. But keep this with you as a reminder of the things that you're not to pick back. And if you go home and you think of more things, write it down. Amen? Because surrender will help you transform. Transform means something that takes place inside, inside of you, that overrides the pressure of outside. Again, Transform means that something that's taking place inside of us that is going to override everything that's going outside, that's happening outside that we can't control. You could control what's in you, not what's outside of you. We can relate to a picture of a caterpillar. Change is taking place in the caterpillar. We don't see the change, but it's taking place in the caterpillar. And then in the outside, once she's transformed into a beautiful butterfly, and that's what God wants to see you. When we allow God to change the way we think, he is now free to change the way we live. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's pretty much it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I hope you learn to surrender. Amen? So now um, I'm going to have my sister Eileen. She's going to talk us about how to surrender some of the taxivity stuff in, that we use. <laughs> and uh, after that, we're going to take a five-minute break. And then we're going to come back, and we're going to finish with Sister Addis on purpose. Amen.
Good morning, ladies. Now we are going to completely switch gears here. <laughs> Today I will be starting a series about toxins in our home. And we won't be talking about the obvious toxins, like uh, chemicals in your home, like pesticides or paint thinner, but the hidden toxins lurking in your home, in the air of your home, in your kitchens, and in your bathrooms. We will be learning about all of the items in your home that we think are safe, but they're really not. But how is this possible? Doesn't the government ensure that the products we use in our homes are safe? If these products are so noxious or harmful, why are they available on the market? In theory, yes, our government is supposed to protect us from dangerous chemicals, which, which could make us sick. But here are just a few examples of how the system has failed us. In 1976, the Toxic Substances Control Act was passed. The purpose of this act was to ensure the safety of commercial chemicals. But the day the act was passed, it automatically considered 63,000 chemicals as safe with no safety scrutiny. Companies didn't have to even clear a basic safety review before using a chemical in consumer products. And the Environmental Protection Agency had little power to remove hazardous chemicals already in the marketplace. Now this is really important and we will circle back to this later, but certain products are generally excluded from the Toxic Substances Control Act, including food, drugs, cosmetics, pesticides, and more. Furthermore, the new chemicals that are tested for safety are not tested for synergistic or compounding effects. Well, what in the world is a synergistic or compounding effect? <laughs> Synergism comes from the Greek word synergos, meaning working together. In toxicology, synergism refers to the effect caused when exposure to two or more chemicals at one time results in health effects that are greater than the effects of the individual chemicals. For example, chemical A has effect A and chemical B has effect B. But when you combine chemical A and B, the combined effect is more acute or stronger than the individual effects of those chemicals. Recent research has shown that the synergistic effects among chemicals used in different combinations is much more dramatic than what was previously thought. Yet we continue to test chemicals for their possible carcinogenic potential in isolation from each other. So even though science is showing us the heightened dangers of combining chemicals, companies continue to only test the effects of individual chemicals and the government has basically turned a, bl a blind eye to this problem. So in summary, when the Toxic Substances Control Act was passed, it grandfathered in tens of thousands of chemicals without any safety scrutiny, and any new chemicals introduced into the market are not tested for synergistic effects. When have you ever seen a product that only had one ingredient? 
So while there are regulations in place for toxic substances, here we see only a couple of examples of the many loopholes in the system. Now on to the next question. Does this really affect me? Do I need to change my lifestyle? I'm fine just the way things are. The next study I'm going to share with you is one of the most alarming scientific articles I learned about in my three years of environmental studies classes. In 2005, a study found an average of 200 industrial chemicals and, and pollutants in umbilical cord blood from 10 babies born in US hospitals. Now 200 chemicals is just the average they found per baby. There was a, com there was a combined total of 287 chemicals found in the 10 babies' umbilical cord blood. Now here's the catch. Had they been able to test for a broader range of chemicals, they would have certainly detected far more than 287. But there are challenges, challenges when testing blood for industrial chemicals. First, chemical manufacturers are not required to disclose methods to detect for chemicals in humans. Second, laboratories have to independently develop methods to test human tissues for the vast majority of chemicals on the market, and the few tests that they do develop are expensive. So what are all the consequences of these chemicals found in utero? Infertility, miscarriage, preterm births, and low birth weight, neurodevelopmental delays such as autism and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, adult and childhood cancer, childhood asthma, and male birth defects. This is not a comprehensive list. Even more alarming is some health disorders can surface not only in childhood, but as an adult. Studies now show toxic exposures in early life can lead to a range of adult diseases, including Alzheimer's, mental disorders, heart disease, and diabetes. For example, low birth weight is shown to be linked with adult onset of coronary heart disease, again diabetes, stroke, hypertension, depression, and other conditions. Furthermore, adult disorders linked to a newborn's low birth weight causes adverse effects not in, only in those babies born small, but also in their children. So the effects are multi-generational. Not only are the chemicals which cause low birth weights harming your children into adulthood, the conditions are passed onto your grandchildren too. Even if your grandchildren are born at a healthy weight. With this information, do you still think this doesn't affect you? Or things are just okay the way they are? Most importantly, we are commanded to take care of our temples. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 to 20, it says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit yes. who lives in you and was given to you by God, you do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. So are we honoring God when we know what all these chemicals are doing to our bodies, but we just can't be bothered 
with changing our lifestyles. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29, it tells us, For no one ever hated his own body, but instead he nourishes and protects and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. We are supposed to nourish and protect and cherish our bodies just as Christ nourishes, protects, and cherishes us. God sacrificed his son so we could be saved and made whole. I know I've already given you a lot of information, but this was just setting the foundation for our next topic. Indoor air quality or the lack thereof, which is indoor air pollution. I have a diagram here. Diagram one. No, it's the one with the, no, the first one. Before that? No, it didn't make it in? Okay. Usually when we think about air pollution, our mind immediately pictures an industrial area pumping tons of smog into the environment or being stuck in traffic um, like downtown or the expressway. Speaking of traffic, does anyone know what is the most car-clogged city in the United States? Boom, Los Angeles, yes. <laughs> so you would expect that the dominant source of toxic gases to come from vehicle emissions, right? Wrong. Not anymore. Now, consumer products, including toiletries and cleaning fluids, emit the most toxic gases in Los Angeles. Think about that for a second, ladies. Toxic gases from the products we use on a daily basis exceed the level of car fumes in the most traffic congested city in the United States. The Clean Air Act, which was originally passed in 1963, is responsible for protecting and improving the nation's air quality but this only regulates the air outside. There are no federal laws to protect indoor air quality, and only two states have indoor air regulations, California and New Jersey. So first we have a, a diagram of some sources of indoor air pollution. Okay. So we see here all of some of the sources of indoor air pollution, uh, cooking, freshly painted rooms, smoking, pet dander, which are all exacerbated by poor ventilation. And in red, we have scented items. So what are the health implications of indoor air pollution? Next, I have a slide summarizing some of the serious health effects of poor indoor air quality. Headaches, anxiety, heart ailments, lung infection, sneezing, coughing, irritation, asthma. This is just awful. On the positive side, improvement, improved air quality extends life expectancy in the elderly, saves lives in adults, promotes lung growth, reduces the risk of asthma in kids, and increases the birth weights in newborns. And we already talked about some of the devastating implications of low birth weight. 
During my undergraduate studies, I was immersed in this day after day. After about the first year, I went home and told my sister how we were being assaulted at every turn, from the air we breathe, to the water we drink, the food we eat, and the products we use. She responded, well, what are you gonna do, Eileen? You can't live in a bubble. <sighs> I was so irritated by this answer. <laughs> but she was right. We can't live in a bubble. But what we can do is limit our exposure so that we have a better quality of life for us and our children and our children's children. Amen. Knowledge gives us the ability to make informed decisions. And if you don't have a basic understanding of what chemicals are doing to us and our future generations, then how can we make changes for the better? By educating ourselves, we make better decisions that will help us, most importantly, limit our exposure. You can start reading labels, looking up ingredients, or use apps to check for product safety. The Healthy Living app from EWG or the Yucca app. <laughs> Next month on Saturday, September 3rd, we will learn about all the different scented products that are wreaking havoc on our health, no pun intended. <laughs> this includes air fresheners, scented candles, perfumes, scented cleaners, or other cleaners that just straight up release toxic fumes. But don't worry, we also will go over good alternatives for these products. Then we will learn about cosmetics. Remember, Cosmetics are excluded from the Toxic Substances <laughs> Control Act. <laughs> All the different products we use on our skin, hair, and nails do not require any testing. Wow. We'll look at chemicals we should ab be avoiding in our personal care products, and we'll identify some of the safer products on the market. Last, we will learn about great alternatives for cooking utensils, pots and pans, and food storage. Again, this is all leading us to a path of minimizing our exposure to toxins in the environment. I'd like to wrap up today's topic with one last verse. Psalms 139, verse 14. Psalms 139, verse 14. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. God created our magnificent bodies. Our bodies are the most complex machines on earth. Amen. They work in ways that medicine and science are still trying to figure out. Even though the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, our father is Jehovah Rapha, Amen. the God who heals. Amen. We cannot live in a bubble and protect ourselves 100% from toxins, but we can limit our exposure and have faith in the one and only living God, our protector, our shield, our healer. Thank you, ladies, for your time and broadcast viewers. Wow. Let's give a round of applause to Almighty Lori. Wow. Wait, uh, well, we're going to take a five-minute break. Uh, social media will be back with the last teaching about purpose. Um, so don't tune out. Yeah, just take a five. Go get some, uh, I don't know if I want to, go get some water. <laughs> get some water. You know, ladies, um, what I do want to say is that this series is going to continue about toxic environment and how we can um, create a more um, wholesome living environment. But don't get overwhelmed. Okay, We're, we will provide you the notes if you want the notes. 
And also, what I always tell the la ladies when we're training, you know, and we're, we want to, um, you know, have a better body, we want to get in shape, and we want to eat better, and there's so many things that you want to give up, or you should give up, or we need to give up, I say, just gradually, you know, don't, don't think of so many things I need to get, get rid of, but better things that you could start adding, adding into the environment, better things, better plants that clean the air, better whatever. And then before you know it, it's going to be a better transition than it being overwhelming, right? So great teaching, Eileen. I loved it. I can't wait till next month. Uh, now, next Saturday, when we go, when the guys meet here, if you ladies want to come, at 7.30, we could carpool, and we're going to go work out at the bridge, okay? So remember, this, this um, um, uh, the women's group, this ministry of Women of Valor, Rise Up Women of Valor, is to also be fit in the body, right? So we're going to hit all areas. So we're going to go to the bridge. You could walk, jog, run, swim, whatever you want to do. You go in your space. I'm there. We're all there to encourage ourselves to get fit in the body, breath, and get some fresh air for the lungs and the sun and vitamin D and all this. Okay, so 730 next Saturday, whoever wants to carpool, and then we'll come back over here. So let's go take a five-minute break. Don't forget your surrender flags. Uh, turn in your, your, your little things if you're done with it, um, the little pens, and um, keep your flags. Okay, five minutes. Um, you have something, Ame? Um, I was just here last Friday or last week. Uh, the slide over the toxics in the home, someone wants to take a picture.
All right, ladies, it's time to get back. I see the peanut gallery back there <laughs> eating. Let me know when we're on. So ladies, um, this is the first time that we tried this. Two seconds. All right, go. <laughs> well, welcome back. I just have one question for Eileen. Where is she? Oh, Eileen, why did you look at me when you were talking about makeup and perfume? <laughs> I'm not the only one that wears that here. <laughs> She's been to my house. She knows I have those little scent things connected to, plugged into the walls everywhere. Uh, but that's about to change. We need to change. We need to surrender those things that are not good for us. So today, I'm going to talk to you about what is your purpose. And when I volunteered to do this topic, I didn't know that it was going to be so complex. Because the response to this question is so easy, yet man makes it so complicated. When I googled what is your purpose, over a billion inquiries came out and things that and I'm like, what is this? Is this so complicated? Well, it turns out that I looked, for, I looked at a study that was done 10 years ago, 10 years ago, mind you, and it said that 10 years ago, Amazon was selling 151,928 books on that subject. So I looked at some of them, and if you start reading some of these things, they're ridiculous. And that's what the, how the enemy wants to confuse you so that you don't know what your true purpose in life is. Okay? So today we're going to answer that question, which is very easy. I looked at a TED Talk. I don't know if you know what that is, but um, if you don't, I'll explain it to you later. In this TED Talk, it was a very famous producer. I'm not going to say who he is. And he was saying that he had his 25-year reunion from Yale University a few years ago. It was like 10 years ago. And he wanted to catch up with his school schoolmates, which he hadn't ca caught up in years. And when he was talking to them to see what was going on in their lives, they were all very influential. They were highly educated. They had a lot of money. They were people of power, yet over 80% of them said that there was no meaning to their life. They were empty. They didn't know why they were here on earth. But don't think that that number is alarming. Dr. Miles Monroe says, or he said because he's gone to be with the Lord already, he said that over 90% of the people in the world, including Christians, do not know what their purpose in life is. And that is sad. So we're going to come into light of this topic. It is not about how much money you make or not make. It is not about how educated you are or not educated you are. It's about knowing the God who created you and what he wants you to do here on earth. Amen. You're born, you live, you die, and the life you live here on earth is going to define where you are in eternity. Only here is when we're going to get a chance to make a decision and choose heaven or hell. And it's sad that so many people are choosing the wrong path and are ending up in eternal damnation. 
Ecclesiastes uh, says in 2, chapter 2, 16, 16 through 22. This is a book written by King Solomon, who the Bible says was the wisest man at that time. And this is what he wrote at the beginning of the book, because he was on a quest to find out what meaning life had. And he said, the title of this is, Without God, Everything is Pointless. Uh, verse 16 says, Neither the wise person nor the fool will be remembered for long, since both will be forgotten in the days to come. Both the wise person and the fool will die. So I came to hate life because everything done under the sun seemed wrong to me. Everything was pointless. It was like trying to catch the wind. Have you ever tried to catch the wind? You can't, right? And that's what the wisest man said. Verse 18. I came to hate everything for which I had worked so hard under the sun because I will have to leave it to the person who replaces me, who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. He will still have control over everything under the sun for which I worked so hard and used my wisdom. Even this is pointless. Then I fell into despair over everything for which I had worked so hard under the sun. Here is someone who had worked hard with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he must turn over his estate to someone else who didn't work for it. Even this is pointless and a terrible tragedy. What do people get from all their hard work and struggles under the sun? Their entire life is filled with pain and their work is unbearable. Even at night, their minds don't rest. Even this is pointless. Now the story that I was telling you about those Yale graduates, which are supposed to know so much, those that we sometimes look up to because we say, wow, how did they get there? What did they do? This is a description of them if they don't turn their life to Jesus. Their life on earth is pointless. So they work hard to make money, to have material possessions, then worry about losing it, lose sleep over it. And it's not wrong to work hard and have possessions because the, Bi the Bible says that even King Solomon was the richest man on earth at that time. He had all the riches. Okay, it's not wrong, but if you live for these things and not live for God, it is pointless. Ecclesiastes, at the end, King Solomon said, uh, oh, by the way, he, there were over 30 verses in Ecclesiastes that he talks about vanity because everything here is really vanity. If you're not putting God first, everything is vanity because it's going to be wasted away. It's going to be pointless. So King Solomon mentioned, uh, mentioned the word vanity over 50 times because sometimes he says vanity of vanities, all is vanity, and he will say that in just one one of the, uh, the verses, so it went on and on. So he said it over and over and over again. So in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he said at the end, when he finished writing the book of Ecclesiastes, he said, after having heard all this, this is the conclusion. What is it? Fear God and keep his commands, because this applies to everyone not just Christians, to everyone. God will certainly judge everything that is done. This includes every secret thing, whether it is good or it's bad. Let's look at a quote from Pastor Rick Warren. He wrote 
the purpose-driven life. I don't agree with everything that he's that he wrote there, so I haven't really finished the whole book because I stopped. But I love this quote from him. And it's, we should apply this to our lives. Without God, life has no purpose. Remember, we're here to find out about our purpose. Life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance or hope. That is a great quote from him. So Apostle Paul, um, at the beginning, was a Christ hater. But he turned his life around. And then he became a Christ promoter. He was flogged at least five times with the Jewish... Um, Lashings, which is 39 lashes. He was beaten, stoned. He was imprisoned several times. He was stoned and left for dead. He was persecuted and betrayed. He was hungry and thirsty. His life was constantly threatened. He was forced out of many places. Assassinations, plots against him. You name it, he went through it. One time... He was a prisoner being transported to Rome to appear before Caesar, and he was on a voyage by ship. At one point, Luke, who wrote the book, said, neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. That was in, in Acts 27, uh, 20. You see, in ancient times when the captain couldn't see the stars or the moon or the sun, they had no way of knowing which way they were heading. So this went on, this storm went on for days and they had lost all hope. But the Lord told Paul. Then Paul stood up and telling everyone they should take heart because God had assured him in a dream that he would appear before Caesar and that in the meantime he would also keep everyone safe. Yet through it all he was faithful. All everything he went through he was faithful until the end. And this is what he said in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. Our lives need to be poured out as an offering to God. That is the least we can do for everything that God has done for us. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And listen to what it says here. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearance, to his appearing. Dr. Miles Monroe um, has this to say about our lives, about the Christian lives. He says that we need to know, number one, who am I? That is the first question. That is your identity. Now, that doesn't have to do with gender identity, but we know that now people are struggling with gender identity, which when he wrote this, it wasn't as bad as it is now. But... Most of us struggle with identity. That's why most of us are other people. We don't know who we are, so we mimic someone else. We aren't who we really are, we're created to be. We want to look like other people because we're not sure of who we are, and we want to put ourselves in other people's identity to feel important. 
We have lost our own self. We have lost our true self. Number two, identity and source go together. Okay? Number two says, where am I from? That's your source. Now, since you can never know who you are until you find out where you came from, who created you, why did he create you, how he formed you, and like Eileen was saying, it's the way that God created, there, we're so intricate. There's so much that we don't even know yet of how we're made, the composition of how we're made. Okay, so we need to find out from where we came from. And you cannot find out where you came from if you don't know who you are. But number three, why am I here? That's what we're going to learn today, right? Your purpose. Why was I born? Now look at this. This question is the question that most people battle with. This question is also tied to number one and number two. Because if you don't know where you are from, which is your source, and you don't know who you are, which is your identity, you will never know why you are here, your purpose. So number four, what can I do? What is your potential? What am I capable of? Potential. This is the power that God gave you. What God, when he created you and formed you in your, your mother's womb, when he was, he says that he knew you. That is the potential that God has put in each and every one of you. But guess what? 95% of the people in this room are living under their potential, under your ability. And I am serious, and I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that you have a phone. I don't know how many functions a phone has. Let's just say it has 25 functions. I know it's more than that, but 25. And you only use five because those are the only ones that you know how to use. You are shortening, shorting your, yourself from what the potential that that phone has if you're only using five functions. So you need to know what your potential is because your potential, Alina, is not going to be the same as Sandra's potential and is not going to be the same as Anna's or Angela's or Eileen's. It's not. We all have different potential. That's why we need to discover it. And don't listen to the people around you. Because culture is going to try to identify the potential that is in you. And you can't listen to that because you're going to fail. That's setting yourself up for failure. The next one is, where am I going? Your destiny. Without knowing your, our final destination, we are prey to the illusion that our lives here on earth do not matter. And we will have no connection or impact on the people around us. So why are we here? Why am I here? Why are you here? What is the real purpose? And remember I told you at the beginning that there were billions of responses to that question on, the, on Google. You don't have to go further because the Bible tells you exactly what your purpose is. It is, is it to have a job, to raise a family, to go on vacation, to have children, to have grandchildren, to have an education? What is the reason for our existence? And this is the answer. God made you for his glory. Only for that reason. He made you for his glory. He made you to give him glory by the way you live, 
here on earth, the way you think, and the way you feel. You can turn and shift the way you feel by reading the word. Know who you are in Christ. That is so important. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, whatever it is that you do, do all to the glory of God. Whether you're feeding your family, whether you're working, whether you're serving at church, whatever it is, whether you're pumping gas at a gas station, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Because people are watching you. People are watching you. We are on this planet by God's design in order to give him glory. You are not your own. You were created by God and for God. And all of us, including those who have not given their life to the Christ or to Christ, are going to be going to see the Father one day, going to see Christ one day in the judgment. You were redeemed, bought for his glory. That's why you are here. Both the Old and the New Testament have a lot of Bible verses that say that man was created to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That is a primary purpose of all of us. Making a living is secondary. That, put it, is secondary. The first thing that we need to do is give God the glory. When we glorify God, we are fulfilling the purpose of our existence. We don't have to prove our, ourselves when we go to heaven. We have to prove ourselves here on earth. Every morning when you wake up, and I know that pastor says to thank God for another day, yes, but you need to say, I report for duty, Lord. I choose to glorify you today. How can we glorify you? Put people in my path that I can glorify you. Now be careful because sometimes he'll put trials at people that are going to poke you. <laughs> and uh, you're not going to feel like glorifying God, but it says here that that's what you were meant to do. So if you have that mindset early in the morning, it'll make it a little bit easier. It's so sad to see people in the world trying to be happy without God. And even people who come to church trying to be happy outside of glorifying God. You will never be truly happy that way. It is impossible. You can be temporarily happy, but you will not be eternally happy. You won't please the Father. And when we make it a point and a purpose to glorify God, happiness chases you over and over again. You will have joy. You will have passion for living. You will have a different mindset. So this is my last verse today. Uh, I'm going to be wrapping it up. And it's, so how do you glorify God? This is going to be our closing Bible verse, and it's found in John 15, 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit that does bear fruit, he prunes. He doesn't cut you off. He prunes you, okay? The ones that are bearing fruit. So that it will be even more fruitful. Notice that if you're producing fruit, God the Father will come and also prune you. How many have been pruned by God? I think we can all say we've been pruned once or twice. 
But that's only to make you better because when you prune a plant, what happens? It makes it stronger, right? Yes, it makes it, it gives better fruit. It's just different. Number th verse three, you are already cleaned or pruned is another word for cleaned. Because of the word I have spoken to you, remain in me as I also remain in you. The uh, King James Version says, abide in me. Other versions say, say, stay connected in me. Be close and with me. Be in union with me. And I will be in union with you. Why? Because no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine who is Jesus. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Wait, I'm sorry. Neither can you bear fruit unless the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Set apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and, I will, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now, the fruit bearing is not just on Sundays. That's not the only day we have to bear fruit. Fruit bearing is every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a week until... God calls you home. Amen. And verse 8 says, when you bear fruit, my Father is glorified. That is our purpose, to glorify God. So if we are to glorify God, we need to bear fruit, good fruit. What kind of fruit, you may ask? When you are kind and bear the fruit of kindness and love, and of mercy, when you love people that are different than you, when you are patient with people who are getting on your nerves, when you are, that, that's for your surrender flag <laughs> that we learned earlier today, when you are forgiving, the God, when God the Father is glorified. When you spread the good news of Jesus and souls are being saved, God the Father is glorified. The tree produces a flower before it becomes a fruit. And do you know how that fruit, I'm sorry, how that flower is produced? It is produced by the sap of the tree. And the sap of the tree is the life's blood of the plant. Oh, wow. Isn't that amazing how God's examples, I mean, everything is just lines. That is the blood of the vine, Jesus. But the blood of this vine that we're attached to if we're Christians. Mm -hmm. The tree then produces um, the fruit all different types of fruits, apples, figs, whatever it is, it will produce. So if you stay connected to the life of the spirit that he has put in us and the vine, which is Jesus Christ, we are the branches and we only have life if we are connected to the vine. If not, 
we are empty. We are lifeless, like those people that I was telling you about earlier. So Satan is always trying to take away from us abiding to the vine. He wants to, us to stop being connected to the vine, which is Christ. He wants us to stop trusting Christ because we're leaning on our own understanding. And he's trying to get us away from leaning on Christ. But if we remain faithful, God will do what his word says, and he will be faithful. So, ladies, it's time to rise up. It's time to know who you are in Christ. It's time to walk in God's purpose for us. It's time to have a clear vision of our destiny. And most important, it's time to give him glory by the way we live. Thank you, ladies. Can we give God some glory? Come on, louder, louder. Amen. What a great teaching. What a praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to dismiss the broadcast, broadcast viewers by announcing that our next gathering is September the 3rd. Saturday, the September 3rd at 9.30 a.m. Either join us at 12601 Sunset Drive in Miami or tune on right here in this channel. God bless you all. All right, ladies, uh, let's stand up. How many of you received today? Wow. Amen. 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 Don't forget.